You're listening to Tremendous Leadership with Dr. Tracy Jones. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tremendous Leadership Leaders on Leadership podcast, where we pull back the curtain on leadership and we talk to leaders of all ages and stages about what it takes to pay the price of leadership. And I am so excited. Today, my guest is retired Lieutenant General Michelle Johnson. General, welcome. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Tracy. And it's been so good to know uh, someone from my my decade at the Air Force Academy. (laughs) I love it. So listeners, let me tell you a little bit about Lieutenant General Retired Michelle Johnson. She was the class of 81 at the United States Air Force Academy. Yes, my alma mater. So you know how tremendous she is. So 81, that was the second class of women that graduated. So she was also the first female cadet to be named Cadet Wing Commander, which is quite the deal. And she later went on to become the first female officer to serve as the Air Force Academy superintendent. So she was our 19th soup, the one and only currently, the only female, talk about a trailblazer, Michelle, that has been appointed to be the superintendent of one of the service academies. Not only that, she was also inducted into the inaugural class of the United States Air Force Academy Athletic Hall of Fame, so she's a jock too, and a Rhodes Scholar. She's brilliant, okay? And while in uniform, she served as the Air Force aide to the president, and she was also an Air Force squadron group and wing commander. Let me tell you, she flew C-141s, KC-10s, KC-35s, C-5s, and C-17s. And also she worked at the NATO shape, uh, where she was the deputy chief of staff, intel and operations. She also served with the NBA as the senior vice president, head of referee operations, and she is married to the tremendous John Hargraves, and she's a retired pilot and the happy parents of two 20-year-old sons. Michelle, I just wish you would have focused and done something with your life, sister. (laughs) Holy moly, I salute you. I'm I'm starstruck. Okay, so this is how I connected with Michelle. This is just the tremendous people you meet in the books you read. Last month in September, I was in Philly. Um, uh, many of you know I talk about the American College of Financial Services often, and I am have the blessing of serving on their Center for Military and Veterans Affairs. And every year they do a Soldier Citizen Clam Bake Award, and we uh, we gave the award to Admiral Mullen from the Navy last uh, this past September. And while I was there. I had the amazing honor of actually, I hadn't met her yet, connecting and sitting at the table with Michelle. So that's where we met. And Michelle, do you want to tell them about your connection with the American College of Financial Services? Well, it's it's been a wonderful association. I I was a friend and colleague in the Air Force with the provost uh, when I was on faculty at the Air Force Academy. uh, Gwen Hall was as well. And she introduced me to the new CEO of the American College, George Nichols who is a transformational leader. Maybe he would talk with you sometime. He is somebody who was born, um, I was born in Iowa uh, without a lot of means. Um, He was born in Kentucky without a lot of means, but he made his way through New York life insurance. And he's come back to give back and to take this college that had been sort of a designation correspondence school for people in the financial industry and to take it to the next level. And to not only help make it a robust educational opportunity for people in financial services, but to help bring applied practical financial knowledge to people who need it in underrepresented communities like veterans. And so that's, I am uh, try to be a great supporter of the Veterans Center that you're an advisor for. And, uh, and but he's also a center for uh, African-American uh, members of the financial community of families with people who suffer disabilities. They have special financial planning challenges. So to try to attend to like the realities of what human beings deal with in life who maybe haven't been touched uh, by knowledge of, of financial practices and, and the way things work. So the, the whole atmosphere is one of service that reminds me a little bit about the service you and I uh, tried to provide to our country, but in a different way, service to others in, to build community. And, and that's what drew me. And I'm so honored to be one of the trustees on the board of trustees for the college. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. And I love that you said, come back to give back. And that is, as we transition through a lot of our listeners, they're on their second, third, fourth careers. And they're just, they just keep coming back 
to continue to give back. So, Michelle, my father wrote a speech called The Price of Leadership many years ago, and it's one of the ones that has been most downloaded because it's very raw, it's very authentic, and uh, it's very practical. And in it, he talks about the things that you are going to have to be paying as a price to be a leader and not just a leader in name only. And I just can't wait to hear your take on this, especially the first one, loneliness. And, you know, there was few of us women in my class at 88. Um, I think there was, what, 97 in the first class of females at the Air Force Academy. And so you're already kind of a small group. But then to be the first, the one, the only, can you unpack what loneliness looks like for you as a time in your career as leadership and what you would share with our listeners, maybe if they're going through a season of it? Well, there are different angles of it, you know. As you as you point out, you know, to go and suddenly become a minority. I'm from I'm from Northwest Iowa, so I was not in a minority there. Right. Um, as a woman, I mean, we're half, you know, part of the humanity, but also just as a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Um, so I went to the Air Force Academy, and just suddenly from being a woman and just a lot of other factors, I was a minority, and it was a new idea to people. They didn't study the history. We could talk about this more later, but what was really happening? You know, when I graduated from high school in 1977, what, you know, the all-volunteer force needed everybody, all, all hands on deck. We can't just draft people now, and it can't just be one certain group of people. We need everybody in an all-volunteer military force. Well, I didn't know that at the time. I just thought it was an opportunity to, for education. Um, I was a basketball player, and uh, but also to serve for a while. Um, so it was lonely and shocking. You know, it was really aggressive, you know, in your face, you don't belong here, kind of lonely. And so you really have to cleave to what you believe, what you're striving for, what's the shared purpose. And fortunately for every ugly uh, interaction, and some officers did as well, officers, uh, cadets, men and women, it wasn't just men, um, you don't belong here. But for every one of those, there were five or 10 great educators and mentors who'd say, well, you're capable of this, why don't you try it? Why don't you try for a scholarship? You know, why, why don't you make sure you're in the flying program? You know, I didn't know, I, it says Air Force Academy, I know that, but but my family, you know, was a farmer, so they didn't even think about that. So that's part of it. But the structural sort of loneliness thing, that's part of some things. But I found as I got more senior, you know, I served, I was in uniform for 40 years, basically, if you include the four years from the academy. And toward the end of my careers, I was more senior and I'd be put in different organizations to help solve problems. Um, I was a stranger because I hadn't been in their community or their tribe for a long time. So it was professional loneliness. You, you haven't done what we've done. Um, so it was very interesting skill set, but I think there were similarities. And uh, but But part of being a leader, if you wish to do that, is to be out of your comfort zone and move other people out of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So you may have read uh, Marty Linsky's work on adaptive leadership, and this isn't a military thing. This is just modern leadership. You know, leadership isn't always just conforming, following the rules and checking the box. That's kind of management, which you need to. Management is super important. Got to do that. Or if, if you don't keep the books right, you're in trouble. But if you want to adapt to new things, to new demands, new missions, you, you need to move an organization and yourself out of a comfort zone and that's lonely and you're it's in your new territory and you're not where you want to be yet but you're pretty far far from shore you know and you need to find a way to move forward and and to understand it and i think understanding the history of how you got there to prepare say how did we get here mm -hmm. and where are we trying to go and then communicate that to help you through the loneliness. But but it's a real thing. Like I, I deployed one time when I was in KC-10s in the 90s. We spent a lot of time deployed at Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. I mean, I could give tours of Abu Dhabi. I, I was there from during Iowa. the first Gulf War. We called right. it Shaw Air Force Base, Shaw, Shaw Abu Dhabi. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And it's very it's very elaborate now, evidently. But we were still in tents, you know, and then and, and the rocks out there. Um but we would deploy from our squadron. Our squadron was in uh, California, Travis Air Force Base, mm -hmm. uh, near, near, uh, between Sacramento and, and San Francisco. We would deploy out. And usually when you deployed, you, you took on next level responsibilities. So um, my captains and majors had to take roles as schedulers and, and, and flight commanders at a greater level than they would have had home. And so I ran into one of our majors and we're standing outside in 135 degrees, which was something I shouldn't admit, that was a bad idea. But he stopped me and he said, Colonel, I was a Lieutenant Colonel and he said, I get it now, it's lonely, 
being in charge of people or, or being responsible. And he was feeling it. He said, when you walk in the room, people stop talking because now you're them. It's, it's us and them. And now you're them. And if you can prove that you care about them mm. and the shared mission more than yourself, yeah. uh, it can, you can work. It, everybody benefits. But if right. you, if you try to act remote and act like you are the warlord and uh, you're the strong person leader, do what I say, I'm the boss. It just, the divide's worse and it's bad. It's terrible for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, when I run into people in, in private sector, sometimes they think that's what leadership is, mm -hmm. that you're the boss and you just tell people what to do. What I learned on the contrary is, how did we get here? Where are we going? Communicate that, be consistent and fair, and people will come along with you and help accomplish tremendous things. And Michelle, you see what I did there with tremendous. I'm just. I saying. do. I. You know. So you get bonus. You get bump. That was awesome. And it, I, I love that you said that. Now talk to me. I know. I love that you talked about. Hey, when you go into other organizations, because we've had a lot of people in the military. I know they get to the colonel level, and then they go into these staff positions, or they're in more civilian sectors outside of their tribe. And you have to show you care and share, because otherwise, I've seen some really bad culture clashes and it chew up some really great people and spit them out. But when you came out of wearing the uniform after 40 years, we have people in our tremendous tribe that are leaving um, entrepreneurship or leaving the life insurance and to go and do the next chapter. And when you came out of uniform, I know like me, it is different because it's such a collective. It's such camaraderie. It's so much fun. It's so crazy. It's so scary. But how do you, um, what would you recommend? But I think that loneliness, when you come out of, you know, uh, whether you're selling a business, well, I was a chiropractor for 30 years and now I'm not. How do you, like, where are you at right now in that transition? Because I know it hasn't been all that long. Right. So I retired in, in 2017 from the Air Force and I left the NBA in 2019. Um, but I, I'm going to touch on some of your other points that you're going to bring up because I think, you know, what your dad hit on, you know, really applies. Uh -huh. A part of it is um, in executive leadership, you know, and I became a generalist, by the way, you know, so executive leadership is kind of being a generalist because the main thing that you are expert at, perhaps for a long time, is just one of many things that you're in charge of. Mm -hmm. And because... Uh, your confidence as a professional may have been based on that competence in a particular, you know, flying that plane. I mean, all the planes had different cultures too. Each crew, the way you pronounce the checklist. I mean, there was a different culture than the way you did the bag drag. I mean, it was, you know, I, I flew cargo around the world, C-141s, you know, on the ground. It's the next thing up from a C-130. So you're in the dirt working. You're considered kind of knuckle busters, kind of mm -hmm. uh and you dragged your own bag and, and you helped each other and you helped the, with maintenance. And then KC-10s were kind of Gucci. It was like, well, these are fancy planes and we wear headsets and we park at different places. And so it's a different way to communicate and to maneuver. So I had a pretty collected career in the Air Force, even operationally. But when I would talk with uh, senior um, officials, even civilians in the DOD, let alone, as you said, in private sector, um, you can be a specialist for about so long. And then when you go into management or leadership, you're responsible for a varied uh, spectrum of skill sets. And I found people whose confidence was based on the specific in their competence lost their confidence mm -hmm. because now I'm managing people who know more about many things than I do. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, I was going to talk about the letting go part, the abandonment, my angle on abandonment. Part of it is letting go of, okay, I know what I know, but I'm going to let go of my ego and let go of my fear, my fear that I don't know everything, my fear of I can't control everything and let go and empower the ones next to you. And that was like the last 16 years of my career in the Air Force. I mean, I... I went from a flying wing to being in charge of personnel and air mobility command and then public affairs for the air force. What do I know about that? But I know about bringing people together in their expertise and doing our homework. We visited uh, USAA, um, the senior vice president for corporate communication. How do you communicate in a big enterprise? And so to try to get better and I had my public affairs experts learn. They knew more about setting up a press press conference than I did. 
and that's okay. I had to let go. Um, so big logistics, you know, I had a lot of people who in the military are support people like Navy Supply Corps, you know, their, their logo on their collar looks like a pork chop. And so other people, operators kind of call them pork chops, which is terrible. That's a terrible thing. Not just because it's not respectful, but but in part because a lot of the people who work for me who are Navy Supply Corps went to Harvard Business School. They're really smart about supply chains and big logistics and the national power source. So I just tried to assemble teams who could solve uh, problems. And that's that's what I became. And I was a kind of a change agent because we would have to do things differently. And it would take a few months to earn people's trust that I do care more about the mission and you than about myself. I'm going to be mm-hmm. okay. I was mm-hmm. blessed. At, John was home taking care of me and the boys. He said that was his mission. So I was home. Home was not relaxing because we had twin babies, you know, when I was pretty senior, they pinned on when they were toddlers, they pinned on my Brigadier General stars. Oh my so, God. They, so home was incredibly not restful, but incredibly empowering and full of love. It was safe and recharging. So I didn't have anything to lose. I want to just do my best. And when people realized that, um, whether they were at Fort Meade with cyber, when we did cyber command, or when I wound up at NATO uh, in shape in, in the southern part of Belgium with generals from other countries who'd never been around a woman general officer because other countries just haven't done that yet and had to deal with me. And guess what? Sometimes I had to be tough to get their attention because I'm five feet eight on a good day or used to be. <laughs> and uh, my voice isn't you know baritone. Um, and so when, sometimes, you know, if I said things nicely and quietly the first two or three times, they don't hear it. Um, I, I learned something. I, I don't know if Armand Hammer really said this. Somebody else besides me said this, but I liked it. And I used to repeat it. When you come up with a new idea or you a new thing with a new group of people who don't know you, the first 50 times you say the thing we need to do together, they don't even hear you. It doesn't even register. The second 50 times... Um, they don't understand you. Okay, I heard you, but what? The third 50 times, they don't believe you. At 151, you know, they'll go, oh, is that what you meant? Sometimes our spouses do that, right? I was going to say, anybody <laughs> that's married is this. So this isn't just at work, but however many times it is, it's a lot. Yes. On that 151st time, I have a, a, a memento from a, an old job that they po- put that on a fake magazine cover 151 times. Yeah. On the 151st time, they go, oh, oh, that's what you meant. And then when people start owning it for them, and I say, no, and this isn't me just making up. I don't know. What do I know about cyber? But I know about policy and people working together and strategic mm-hmm. opportunities and operational requirements and how to think operationally. Um, and, and that's why I endured, I think, in service so long. There wasn't a path for women, and I wasn't, women weren't allowed in fighters or bombers when I went to pilot training. We did um, heavies, but when I got out of that tribe, other tribes realized I had something to offer to their tribe, but it was communication, it was consistency, and I had I did my homework. I, you know, they'd say, Johnson, it's a good thing you were right. <laughs> right, right? But sometimes you are the voice in the wilderness. And, and you have to, you know, double check and, and have someone, the last thing I'll say is it's great to have um, an ally, a confidant, a mentor, maybe someone not exactly in your chain of command, but with, it's a sanity check to say, right. I know I'm the voice in the wilderness. I generally don't want to be crazy. Mm-hmm. It sounds crazy to people when it's new. Mm-hmm. And I do have another anecdote about that from the NBA. Um, but what do you think? And just give me a sanity check. Uh, my late sister used to be a great, she worked as a manager in a big insurance company. And so she was my sort of voice of reason on management types of things. Um, my husband loves me too much to be a great critic of speeches. Right. But in terms of practical uh, operational matters, he's a crew dog. We used to say he's a very pragmatic engineer, electrical engineer dude who graduated from VMI. So he could give me the straight scoop, but sometimes I needed somebody else to, from the world that I was in to say, just sanity check. So you're not alone. Leadership is a team sport. And even though you feel alone, you're not alone. Cause the whole point of leadership is being with other people. Well, yeah. um, 
And the, the last thing I'll mention from the NBA is brilliant uh, chief of, of NBA referee operations is still there, Monty McCutcheon. And he, and he and I, he was my, um, my partner. I tried to codify what he knew in process and resources and training, but he's wise. And one time he said to me, oh, Michelle did this brilliant thing. And I said, what brilliant thing? And he said, um, to bring when the, when the referees rotate through uh, New York and Brooklyn and New Jersey during the season, have small group in-season training sessions and go over video and talk about position and, and as they do. And I said, Monty, what's brilliant about that? That's just practical training. That's just continuing training from the intense stuff you do in the summer, you know, do it throughout the season. He said, I never would have thought of that. Mm -hmm. He said, it's brilliant to me because I never would have thought of that. That's from a different world. I brought it from being a pilot in, in the Air Force. And no matter what field you're in, in the Air Force or any service, you right. train, you have resources committed to training, you have criteria, standards for performance, and you evaluate people on that. That's easy. It's not easy to other people who don't know. It was a new idea to him. So again, I, I wasn't alone. But for a while, I was lonely because I had to say that 151 times. <laughs> well, and there's this duality of it. And there are going to be times, and sometimes you need to get alone because you're getting prepped or you're getting purified or we did something or we need to own it. I mean, so it, it's not a bad thing. You know, I've heard people say, well, if you're ever lonely, you did something wrong. Not all no. loneliness is um, some, there are reasons for everything. I mean, hey. you can uh, be accused of something. I mean, you can be. I mean, there's all kind of bad things that happen to good people to put you in a loneliness place. Um, but I love that you talked about, you know, having somebody outside of your chain of command um, to just be an ally or a voice of reason yeah. uh, to sit there. And I think that's so important because otherwise we're too much in the same arena and we can't often get what we need to hear. And people tell us what they think and what or they see it through the same lens that we do. Yeah. So uh, I love I love that you brought that brought that aspect up. Well, you know, and even at the academy, um, it, it's a, a wonder. It's a institution of higher education. It's a commissioning source. It's in a beautiful place. It's a good gig to be in Colorado Springs at seven thousand feet, you know, altitude, and on the side of the mountains on the Front Range, and be with all these wonderful young people from across the world and our country. But obviously, we have country. Uh, cadets from 70 countries across the world that come through. Um, but even that place could become inward looking. Mm -hmm. And I would say, see ourselves as others see us. Mm -hmm. you, know, you may do something and it's motivated by every pure thought, right. but outside externally it's perceived differently because they don't have the context. They haven't lived in that group. And, and that's sometimes, you know, the fresh eyes, the fresh mm -hmm. eyes can be lonely eyes, but you need them as you said, and to, to go off and really reflect and think about how do we get here? What are we trying to do? Um, how, how do we get there together? And recalibrate and, and reorient, you know, how, how we're going to make the end goal. So I love that. Um, so you talked about having the support of your family. The next topic, and again, he talked about was weariness. And I love that you talked about that you had um, the great thing. And people always say that when you have two alphas married, well, how do you guys do it? Do you like kill each other? And I'm like, no, you, you, two alphas mean double the um, resources, double the tenacity, double the we're not quitting, we're not giving up. And it's almost this complimentary thing. So I loved the combat, the work-life balance, because here you are pinning on your star and you have little ones at home. I mean, every woman out there, heck, every man out there um, has to deal with juggling, you know, fortune and family and, and growing that. So you had that to really help you be strong and safe. But what else would you recommend? Because uh, weariness, boy, if we don't stay, especially you had to stay rested to fly, rested to command, alert to make uh, decisions when you're going to a hostile or the fog and friction of war. Uh, how do you combat weariness, Michelle? Uh it sometimes isn't possible to do it on your own. Again, that's one of these things. When I was a squadron commander, uh, my husband was uh, in Okinawa for three years. That was our longest separation. And uh, we only had cats then. So that, you know, we didn't, this way before kids, <laughs> why we were older parents, we didn't live together very often initially. And I remember it was coming up on Christmas and our, our flight surgeon for our squadron and our first sergeant were hovering around my office and I worked 
really long hours. Uh, it was KC-10 squadron deployed all the time. And, uh, and it was, no, it was only about 250 people. People take time. And if you listen to them and care about them and do, do the documentation and everything, it takes a lot of time. So I noticed one evening as Christmas was approaching, these two guys, the, this flight surgeon and the first sergeant were like in my office, just talking with me. And I, it hit me and I looked at them. I said, you're taking care of me, aren't you right now? I said, you're, you're first sergeanting me. You're, you're checking on me. And and they said, yes, ma'am. You know, and you have, and you, again, in terms of letting go, let people help you. It's so hard to ask for help, to even know you need help. And so we saw, you know, at a student level for cadets, they'd get themselves in a hole on grades and all they would have needed to do is just raise their hand and ask for help. Everybody wants you to succeed there. If you're in an organization, unless, unless you're just a hateful, loathsome human being, which hopefully none of us are, people want you and the organization to succeed. And, and if you've been giving to everybody else, they probably want to help you and you need to let them. And that that's super hard. But I think that was a real blessing to have uh, people like that around me. Now, did I always take their advice? No, I was probably horrible about that. But, but you do need to take care of yourself. I think also, you know, um, the, if you have this safe place, sometimes people are, I don't have musical talents, but some people do, but that fills their tank of joy. You know, don't forget, you know, to find your joy. The boys running around, you know, John would leave um, on the wall of the apartment when we lived at the Pentagon. I was a brigadier general at the Pentagon and we lived near the Pentagon so I could walk over, at least be home for, maybe see him at bath time and go to bedtime and stuff. But he'd, he'd say, look at the wall and the big crayon drawing all over the wall that we would have to repaint. But he said, I left it for you because I knew you'd get a kick out of it or the big pile of chairs and pillows and stuff in the living room. Cause that was their fort. Um, that filled my tank and that was terrific. But, but even that said, as driven and type A as I am, and, and you take different roles at home. I was playing type B at home. Mm -hmm. I was the type B person because you both can at the same time. I mean, but he was kind of lead at home and I was lead at work and in different settings and back and forth. But, um, you know, if you read Viktor Frankl at all, right? So here's Viktor Frankl. And if I think I'm having a bad day, I just think, oh my, he survived the Holocaust <laughs> and he lost his whole family and he was a psychologist. Um, and he chose to stay with his family when he could have gotten out. But his writings, I think, are really helpful about the meaning of life. You're doing something you love with people you love. And then when you're faced with adversity, having the attitude to face adversity in a way that's an achievement. You know, see, getting yourself out of a predicament is an achievement. And it doesn't come across as a Rhodes Scholarship or a medal or a lot of money or fame or anything. But if you have the grit, grit's the language that's used more often now, I think, to um, to overcome the challenge. Um, that's empowering. And, and and so even like my, my friend Monty, the head of referees at the NBA, he's a philosopher, a ref, and he talks, he's written, he's not published it, but he's got a, a manuscript. He's written about sport, that people do sports because you want to be challenged against a standard. How, let me see, how good am I at this really? I want to know. I'm going to do my best. And then if I'm not the best, well, doggone it, I'm not. But I'm going to give it my shot. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes some aspects of public service are like that. You know, flying a plane, that's really hard. You don't just pop out of high school knowing how to fly a jet and manage a mission and, and do air refuel and to do the kinds of things we did or, or be a Thunderbird like Nicole Malakowski. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to, I think a lot of people want to be challenged. And to say, how good would I be? And then they go, you know what? Fair, fair and you beat me fair and square. Um, but I gave it my best shot. That's that's how well I could do it. And I think I think that attitude um, is, is is really helpful. And it doesn't matter if you're short or tall or or small. You know, that's one thing about I'll bring back the loneliness a little bit. Is in the, is people seeing you know for me to show up in a squadron, flying squadron. And have people say, I don't know anybody like you. My mother's not like you. My sister's not like you. So how can you possibly be doing this thing? Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, if your attitude is we want to do this thing, everybody, let's, let's all help. Then you can get over that pretty fast mm-hmm. because, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the last thing. Kansas is a, uh, is a, is the home state of the uh, McConnell Air Force Base where I was a wing commander when I had the boys. So I was up all night anyway. There's no sleeping for me as a wing commander because between the calls from command post and the boys, um, that's just how it was. But on a cold winter night in Kansas, when the, the, it was very sub zero temperatures, high winds, we're trying to launch um, a bunch of planes, 20 uh, planes. Everyone on the flight line were like just Gore-Tex blobs. No idea who anybody was, right? Because we just were in, we're blobs of waterproof material, pushing pallets and trying to refuel things. And when everything was said and done, the planes were launched, I went around, as the commander does, I went around to talk with people and thank them and, and check on them, having no idea what they looked like. And as they pulled off their balaclavas and their hoods and everything, I realized um, you can start to see their ranks. You can start to see their faces, their their ethnicity, you know, men and women, tall and short, everything. And um, I was just so moved. I, I, I was moved daily, but I was moved in moments like that. And to just say, isn't this kind of wonderful that we just were who we were? We went out and did what we had to do. And we valued each other. And to me, that's exciting. That fills my tank, that kind of stuff. So that keeps me, you know, and I know I tell people now I'm a mom, so I, you should get your sleep, make sure you eat right, take care of your joints, you know, stuff like that. Right. But, but there's this other kind, this other um, feeling, right. That's just inspiring. And hopefully you can, you can foster that in others. Right. Well, and you said fill the tank and you're right. There was nothing like the military as far as we were all in it together and none of it mattered. And like you said, not the rank, not the anything all bundled up or you're, you're in chem warfare gear or you're just, yeah, yeah. you don't, you can't even tell what people, but we were the collective. So a diverse group, but the ultimate unified mission. So uh, um, that's, and Michelle, you brought up one of my, one of my top, probably one of my top five books. I'm not even going to say 10, Man's Search for Meaning by Victor Frankel. If you want to learn about, you know, resiliency, adaptive capacity and, I tell people that are complaining, read that book, and then you come back and talk to me. And they never come back. They never come well, back to complain. So profound. Well, and you think, I mean, that's a, what a heavy, dark topic. Oh, the my gosh. Topic, you he, read it, and it's full of joy. I mean, it's, and it's not, not to trivialize anything. It's just not no. to trivialize anything. Oh, no, whatsoever. he didn't trivialize it. He taught no. he Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's just, that's profound. Okay. So now you talked, you covered abandonment and I love that. Uh, primarily as you're climbing up, you got to let go of the ego. You got to, you got to be okay with abandoning some of these things that may have worked for you as an individual contributor or a commander at a flight level where you had a smaller, more group. Remember less and less of the outcome. The only outcome of you as a commander is what the individual troops do. So you right. have to start managing the troops versus managing the processes or the the sorties or the non-mission capable rates or all that other stuff. So I love anything else on abandonment you want to talk about. I thought that was just just so rich to share with our audience. Well, at a real one-on-one level, when I was a, a co-pilot in C-141s, and I was a little older than other co-pilots, I was a little more senior. I mean, I was a first lieutenant, not a second lieutenant, because I'd gone to graduate school at Oxford and then was flying. Um and we had lieutenant colonels who'd flown in Vietnam. So really kind of gruff guys. And some who had flown the plane so long, even though they're supposed to, we're all supposed to be dutiful students of the tech orders. They'd kind of quit reading the tech orders because they they knew how to fly it. And the co-pilots kind of would would do the nug work for them. Mm-hmm. And there's this one um, lieutenant colonel, really gruff uh, lieutenant colonel, Tom Naganji, I think hopefully it's okay if I, I say his name. He's a wonderful person. I we really respect the heck out of him. But he scared all the co-pilots. And he had said to me, and, and my husband had flown with him too. And he said to me once, you know, you know, Johnson, I make the co-pilots cry, and that's the guys. But I don't mess with you. But he said, but I don't mess with you. And I didn't know what that meant exactly. But one time he and I were on a check ride, and uh, and so the flight examiner was like sitting right behind the console watching everything we did and we we're getting hey, ready that, to- Michelle, for our listeners a check ride is an evaluation ride it's an, like it's you were getting sh- she's getting graded on uh proficiency yeah yeah and how we ran the checklists and and how we ran the mission and, and the, the, so he and i were on a, an evaluation like you're 
driver's ed in high school, but like mm -hmm. times a thousand. And so I noticed that the in the left seat is where the aircraft commander sits, Colonel DeGangi, his navigation select panel wasn't right uh, with, with the checklist. Um, and so wanting, you know, safety first, right? But also contending with culture, right? You don't touch each other's switches. There's a cultural thing about reaching across somebody, especially somebody imposing like him. Right. Um, so I reached my hand over in front of the the switch that needed to be corrected. And I said, sir, I'll, I'll set your nav select panel up for the takeoff check. And then I waited and I didn't touch it, but I waited. I wanted to show respect to see what, would, but I didn't know what he'd do. And he said, thanks, Co. And so I hit the button, we did the flight and everything went on. And I've actually said that at a commencement speech at Niagara University a couple of years ago. And I said, I know it seems weird to say something like that. Thanks, Co. So what? What he did was kind of courageous in a way. He let me help him. Mm -hmm. So it not only helped us do the mission safely and get to do the check ride and everything, but it modeled for me letting go. And later when I was on missions and I was really tired in the middle of the night in Bahrain or someplace and do the before takeoff checklist, say to the crew, you know, we've all been awake for 36 hours now. Um, so we need to help each other. If you see something, you speak up because we're all tired and we got to get this right. And you help me succeed and, and, and I'll help you succeed and set that attitude. And part of what helped me do that, letting go of my ego, letting go of fear of, oh, they'll think she's weak. You know, so if, if the enlisted guy from the back of the plane came up and said, so on a big airplane, I mean, in the, in the back of a tanker, the boom operators or, or airmen and sergeants, and then the back of a C-17 or a, a C-141, they're load masters or flight engineers back in the old planes before uh, computerized uh, flight, you know, we had flight engineers. And if one of those highly trained people in their own area looked at a dial and said, it looks like you're five knots slow on this, on, you know, our speed, you know, um, information. I was felt like, you know, either say, I know I'm doing it on purpose because we're reconfiguring something or thank you. Thanks for the catch. Because, you know, there's a whole chapter in a Malcolm Gladwell book about outliers, mm -hmm. about culture on a flight deck. But culture and and um, this idea of letting co go really has ramifications. So we used to have um, simulator training on the, some of the scenarios that Malcolm Gladwell also used in a book of his called Outliers about dynamics on flight decks. And he, he used airliners and people from other national cultures were in the rest of the crew really couldn't communicate with the pilot in command because they were in charge. Mm -hmm. So, and, and they wouldn't listen to them. And so there are tragedies that happened because they were running out of gas and the pilot wouldn't either let someone tell him they were out of gas or they wouldn't even try. Right. And they, or they, you know, so they would fall from the sky. Being able to collaborate means listening to each other and letting go again, as we talked about, letting go again of of your own protectiveness, you know, your own personal power. But it's important in a plane. You know, you get someone's going to get hurt if if the chief pilot, the aircraft commander, or the pilot in charge doesn't listen or take an input. You know, as I've said, that there have been accidents, and some came from national cultures of hierarchy. Oh my gosh, that the leading person isn't. I'm the boss, and I I don't have to listen to you. Um, it's literally dangerous. Um, but even if it's not a, an airplane, it's just in general, you're not hearing um, to the totality of what's really going on. You, you're not being informed if, if mm -hmm. you're not listening uh, and taking input from people around you. And I mean, ultimately, uh, a leader has to decide uh, and, and may not follow exactly what those inputs are. Um, that's part of the aloneness, you know, that you, someone's got to decide, but, but just the listening empowers a team to know that they'll be heard. You may not agree, but they'll be heard. And it's, it's, uh, I think it's right. an important lesson. Well, yeah. And, and you really hit on that, how important it is to be courageous enough to manage up. Cause I think yeah. a lot of times, you know, here you are managing down, managing lateral, but to help your boss, your leader become the best that they can. And like you said, 
unless it's illegal, immoral, unethical, or unsafe, you know, you can kind of, but just, just being heard. And so that is for the leaders out there, you, there are going to be times where you have to be courageous enough to, to make the call and say, Hey, I know, but we need to look at this. Excellent. All right. The last thing my dad talked about was vision. And, you know, we hear about these visionaries and, and Michelle, we have our, our heroes of the military that just were sheer brilliant tacticians and motivators and all the greats. Um, but my dad would always tell me, Hey, Tracy, vision is really just um, seeing what needs to be done and then doing it. So this kind of blue sky thing, but also this very tactical strategic thing. And uh, so how do you, how do you hone your vision, especially now that you're in the next stage of your life? I know the military um, would often feed you your vision, but but how do you uh, inspire that in other people? Well, no, it is really it, it's an it's an important notion that it doesn't you don't have to be some genius philosopher to have vision. It's it's what needs to be done, as as you said, and maybe even asking the question, you know, so what? So we're doing this thing. So what? then what? Um, and uh, what's going to happen on the other side of this? Some of it's like planning, if you will, strategic planning, you know, what are the opportunities and what are the risks? Um, and that isn't just a military function. That's a business function. I would think um, I, even on the, the American college of financial services board, we, we, they talk to us about risk, financial risk. What are the risks of with personnel? Um, what's going to happen next? And to my, my point, I think we caught it. Um, with the head of referees for the NBA, when I just suggested in season training, not just in the summer, um, that seemed brilliant and visionary to him. It was just seemed obvious to me. Um, so if, if I thought of that, what are we missing that someone else might think of? And, and to your point of, of managing up as well, as a senior officer, as a general officer, I wasn't always the most senior. I was a two or three star, but there are always four stars, right? And then civilian leaders. And, and to be brave enough to challenge status quo or tell them the truth, tell them the bad news sometimes is just really eye-opening to say, you know, and, and do it privately and give them some grace, give them a way out, you know, so a graceful exit, or we can fix it if you make this phone call or this what needs to be done. But um but to see ahead and assess, and that's that's part of a vision as well. But I think it's to do with like listening and learning. And one of the, the things, you know, in this day and age, people don't always want hard copy books. Um, my husband and I are still of a generation, I guess, that value that tactile feel of a book. And I'm a, I'm aggressive to books. I deface them <laughs> out of you know out of love. I write in them and I bend their pages. But really willing to learn. You know, and and learn and and again to my earlier point about how did we get here as an organization or as a group, and what do we need to do next? That's part of a vision. It's a narrative. You know, what's our story? And maybe that's that's a more palatable way for us to think about. You know, what's our narrative? And hmm. and for me, as a, with a lot of veterans, but a, a lot of other people, you know, at a point in life where you have more discretion about your time, what brings meaning? You know, and and maybe not as profound as Victor Frankel in the, the sense of that meaning, but in the sense of what do I know that might help another group, um, whether it's with corporate memory or just another perspective as a as a board member. Now, you know, board members are not supposed to partake of everyday operations of a of an enterprise, but I always think: Have I asked a challenging question? Have I thought of another angle that they might not have? And you're on the advisory board for the Veterans Center, so you may think of that as well. It's like: Have I asked a good question today um, that they might not have thought of, right? Or another angle, um, and to be supportive in a way that's constructive. It isn't always positive cheerleading. It's sometimes saying, "Well, it, you know, I don't know. There may be some pitfalls on that one. You might want to consider." what could happen from practical experience and then, and also from study. Right. Well, you brought that up earlier. You talked about, you know, we always have something to offer, no matter taking off the uniform, but the way we, we think and, and what I really like for people in the military is um, we always are worst case scenario. 
you know, we're always contingency planners yeah. and we're also after actions people. Yeah. That's the other thing where you talked about, hey, we train it in season and out of season. And that's not intuitively obvious. And I, I'm I, that's interesting. You said that because I can remember sitting in some boards when something would go wrong, not military things. And they're like, OK, well, what's next? And I'm like, wait, wait, we got to do root cause yeah. analysis. What happened here? You know, right. after actions report, no behavior has changed until a lesson is learned and and we we tweak something. So um, I love that you said that it, in a constructive way. Uh, but that's the point of leadership, not an echo chamber, but to right. ask the, the, the tough questions, the great critical thinking skills, because um, we have seen a lot and blended a lot about what could possibly go right. But you can't go into war thinking everything's going to go right. You right. better think everything's going to go wrong and, and kind of reverse engineer from that. Exactly. And, there, and, and again, and tell, and tell that story. It just it just is what it is, you know, and. Um, don't be afraid. I, I, yeah, I, too many people use the word fear. You know, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And I just think, you know, like, you know, I always was thankful. I didn't have to worry in the main about, you know, our boys, you know, going to the shopping center and being bombed, you know, now we live in a violent world and things can happen randomly, but we live in a pretty safe environment right. and, uh, we don't have the day-to-day risks a lot of people have or the food insecurity that a lot of people have and those kind of things. So I count my blessings, but, but to just, so what are we afraid of? You know, and what, what, what do we have to be afraid of? And, and just to say what it is, what it is. And, uh, and to try to persuade people. That's the other thing with, with vision, when you want to do that thing that you see something that is different, I go back to what I said before. They may not even hear you when you say, no, I, I disagree with that. They may not hear you literally the first couple of times. No, really, really. I really think this is a thing. And then and then try to be persuasive in that way. Now, I, after I worked at the White House two years carrying the nuclear codes for President Bush 41 and President Clinton, um, you, you do a lot of advanced work. You have to plan ahead. Here's what what will happen in the worst case that maintains connectivity with the commander in chief and the you know command authority and so you had to think of every possible contingency, medical and communication and physical and, and medical. Did I say that? And, um, you know, and then other 25th Amendment and mm-hmm. and nuclear things. Um, mostly that did, bad things didn't happen. But in order to get um, senior civilians to do what I needed to do, I had to persuade. I had no power over them. I was a major. And, but you have to persuade people to get things done. And people have written about even political power is really a power of persuasion. You're, you're moving people. So I did that to the extent that when I went back to Travis Air Force Base uh, after that assignment, um, one of the sergeants said, um, you know, ma'am, you, you could just tell us what to do. <laughs> you don't have to persuade us. <laughs> I said, well, OK, point well taken on those few transactional things. OK, sorry, I'll tell you. Um, but just an, in, in inspiring things and trying to do new things for an enterprise and to um, have a vision of what happens next, you need to say why and what what will be in it for you? What will your role be in it? So the vision isn't just, you know, we're going to get to that mountain. It's, and how are you going to help us get to the mountain? How am I going to help you get to the mountain? How are we going to do that together? And I think we... Uh, you're obviously a great communicator, but that's not a valued thing in, mil- in military service or around people who are like, um, if you look at Myers-Briggs personalities, I'm an ENTJ. So I think in, I can do the math. I was an operations research undergrad. I, I can, you know, I was like an engineering minor at a service academy. Both of us were. But I, I tend to be an extrovert who, who thinks intuitively, which isn't um, softer. It's just in macro. I think in macro, and I'm a thinker and judger. So we we can go do that, but not everybody can see it. If they're a linear thinker or more sensory or an engineer, they want to know what then what happens, what step is next. So understanding myself and how I think in, uh, and I'm open that way mm-hmm. and that a linear energy engineer, like my husband is a linear engineer. And so there are times we bump and there are many reasons spouses bump, but one of the reasons we do is that we're wired differently and it's very complimentary and it's actually great overall. Um, but when you're working with people who are literal, you know, this idea of a vision might just seem a little too open-ended and you need to help them understand 
what happens next, what's in it for them, um, and how and what what our role is together. They may not uh, automatically see their role in the group um, and in laying it out in a, in a narrative. Again, I think it's really helpful. Well, I love that you described vision as persuasion and moving people because yeah. otherwise it's just your thing, you yeah. know, and vision is shared uh, for the entity. Yeah. And uh, Michelle, you hit on the, the uh, all the books I've read say the number one question anybody has on their mind is what's that for me? Well, well, why too? Uh, yeah, yeah. We have to set the why because vision is, but but in the how, yeah. as far right. as the tactical, the management, the 30,000 yeah. versus um, what's in it for me? I mean, I get the why, but this, you know, yeah. I have to have a reasonable expectation of success and I have to see value in it. And that means what's in it for me. So I love that you had, and I love that you talked about some people are just like, you don't have to, fin- you don't have to woo woo me. <laughs> just, just put on your, and so I put my task hat on as yeah. you do and go, all right, here's the orders. Okay, bye. Actually, I literally did that in that squadron because they thought I was like um, too nice sometimes. So I I had a black hat. I would literally put a black build cap on and I don't smoke, but I had a cigar and I'd get it out and say, okay, now this is me being directive. And we'd like laugh about it. But that was also part of building um, the collegiality of what we're doing. But, you know, someone who I think writes, um, Bess, I don't know if you read Daniel Pink's works but he's a book called drive which i think is is the most realistic about um not just what's in it for me but just calling it as it is about understanding the politics of a dynamic and politics are just human beings together it's not like political parties it's uh, aristotle you know we're political animals because we live with other people and reading understanding who the informal leaders are who the formal leaders are and how to navigate that is is part of persuasion and leading and pursuing a vision Mm -hmm. because those can be helpers or they can be obstacles and uh, the informal uh informal leaders may have more power than the formal leaders weirdly and if you you can harness into that but you can't pretend it doesn't exist and that you know it's just your own idea again this is a team sport well, you you hit the nail on the head when you talk about politicking well. And for those of you that are listening that want to get your CLF, <laughs> we have yeah. a whole class on one of our modules about networking, managing up, and politicking well. And like you said, anybody that has survived in one of the biggest bureaucracies of all time, i.e. the military, as long as you have, you're a great politicker. And we have this, oh, politics, it's sucking up, it's kissing butt, it's yeah. it's partisan. No, 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 no. It's networking. It's coming together because there's a certain amount of resources and it's a win, 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 win. So we have this negative connotation. But I love that you could not have done what you did without getting fed up and saying, and there's a million other paths you could have taken, Michelle, but you stayed on the one because you knew how to be politicking well and not in a derogatory or sell your soul or a cronyism type sense and i'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because we may have some listeners out there that are like i don't know should i stay or should i go and i always tell them listen is it is do you really want to fall on your sword or do you need to open up your mind and spirit about politicking well we're all in this together and we got to find a way forward together and is this just a nuisance or an idiosyncrasy or is this like a point of order that it's um against your conviction and most of the time it's just Something that just annoys us. And I'm like, do you really want to throw it all away for that? Or do you want to learn to politic well? Right. Well, you know, and, and to your point, you're going to have in, in, a, in a career, good bosses, bad bosses, good teams, bad teams. The moments when it's really clicking, when you're on that championship team and it just feels right, those don't last forever because right. somebody leaves right. or something changes. But those those are great moments. I think one of the reasons I endured in this eclectic journey was that I could look, see the patterns and it was eclectic enough. You start seeing the patterns across organizations. That's okay. why people write all these management leadership books because human beings and organizations act about the same. I mean, you have right. different words, it's different language, different uniforms, different hierarchies in a way, but politicking to me was saying if we need to bring some people together or say at the Pentagon with different entities with different equities to defend, try to understand the equities of the others at the table and kind of plan ahead and, you know, not just have allies at the table, but try to think two or three steps out to say, if this person doesn't like this literally happened to me, I, a senior civilian who had been military and 
there was some baggage with that was a real obstacle in working uh, when I was on the joint staff uh, at the Pentagon um, on cyber policy. And um, I stood up to him and said, no, this is the equity I need to represent right now, respectfully, because this is just the truth. And I, I have to, to hold to that. And I immediately went back and went back to my, I was a one-star general and I talked to my three-star general and I said, you may get a phone call from somebody um, because I had to, I had to stand up to them and they're far senior to me. And he goes, Oh, he already called me, but you're, you're, but you're doing the right thing. You were doing right. what you had to do. Right. Um, so that, that's one thing, but to have a successful policy, a lot of times I would try to anticipate when this person wants to work against me, they're going to go to the next level. But if I've already greased the works of the next level by informing them, not paying them off, nothing underhanded, Right. But just saying, this is this part of the story for you to know. When the other person came with their side, they'd be I'd get wind up getting support usually because I did yes. my homework and I was right. prepared and and I I was be factually correct and be able to move forward and it became winning and it worked in NATO across twenty eight allies. Then now we're up to thirty one in NATO, but at the time it was 28 plus 22 partner nations for Afghanistan. So there were 50 nations around and, uh, and sort of just understanding the organization around you and not just your own narrow slice of it. You know, right. where do I fit in? And I think, and people do social uh, mapping, I think for other reasons for to think who would be on board, who would be anti this uh, initiative and just understand that it's just it just is. Who are you going to have to persuade to come forward? Who are you going to have to come on board? And um, and again, not in an underhanded way, but with persuasion, with facts and research and persistence. I will say, persistence helps. Well, and that's why you pay the price of leadership. Because if it was easy, everybody would do, we'd be doing it. Right. But you know, and, coming across against those naysayers, and yeah, that's your example is really managing up well and politicking yeah. well. And um, yeah, that, excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Because I always, I, I love hearing. I, I was hoping you'd get into that, and you said it. Why you endured? I love it because yeah. everybody has their own reasons for it, and um, and that's fascinating, Michelle. Okay, so we did loneliness, we did weariness, we did abandonment, we did vision. But while I've got you on the line. Anything else from a leadership perspective that you would like to share with our listeners about really, you know, how to how to triumphantly, tenaciously pay the price of leadership? Well, just uh, I'll just share a vignette, and it's I, I'm not sure exactly who it's attributed to. I'm told uh, 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 Ianla Van Zandt has said it, and, and other people, but it's something that I've used in remarks. But also, it's a reminder for me, and it's kind of rich, alludes to fear. You know, it says. The saying is, when we come to the end of all the light that we know and are about to step off into the darkness, faith is knowing that one of two things is going to happen. There'll either be something solid in the darkness for us to stand on, or we'll learn how to fly. Yeah. So to me, this is like not being afraid to explore something different. So 1977, you know, 18-year-old me left Spencer, Iowa, to want to see what the big world was like and no clue, no videos on a website, no internet, no family experience in the military or with higher ed really, except for my brother who went to medical school, but he's far older than me. And it was a different time when all the money that we had, which wasn't much went for him. And my sister and I were on my, are on our own um, to give it a try, you know, to, to, to go out, step into the darkness and go, Oh, solid, not as scary as I thought it was going to be, or I need to learn something new to survive in this way and try something new. And it may be more fulfilling. And in my case, it was in the big world. And there were lows. They don't write that in your bio. Nobody writes in your bio, the rough days, the things when, when you met with someone who was a curmudgeon or worse, who tried to undermine you or, or things didn't go well, they don't write that down in your bio. Um, but it's part of the journey. And it makes you appreciate when things click, when you do move a policy through, or you are able to communicate with somebody. Um, you know, I, uh, Admiral Stavridis was sat here, the Supreme Commander Allied Forces Europe, when I was at NATO. 
And uh, he promised the Russians, who had a bigger contingent in Brussels than NATO did, because they're very suspicious of NATO, because NATO was formed to defend against them. Right. And, but he wanted to keep them informed during the conflict in Afghanistan because of their fear of, of opium and the drug trade and then um, uh, terrorism coming over the border. Meanwhile, they gave us overflight and train track access, railroad access from the Baltics all the way to Kazakhstan, to Kazakhstan over Russian airspace and ground space. So Admiral Sevier just wanted to communicate with them. And he sent me to Moscow one summer with a team with a German lieutenant colonel and a British colonel and a U.S. colonel. And then um, and a Norwegian admiral was in, in Moscow to brief the vice uh, director, the vice chairman of their general staff, their four-star. Actually, they were going to have me talk to a two-star, but when I showed up, the four-star showed up. And so I had to adapt. And over a long briefing table, standing over a map and a long lunch, um, you know, we went and did our work and went back. And to me, that was a really a capstone professional experience to represent the equities of my nation in the halls of the Kremlin, you know, the been our foe in so many ways mm -hmm. and so many episodes and to know my business enough to be able to come through and to keep my team together. It was a very emotional experience for the German officer. Can you imagine in paintings in the Kremlin of um, General Zukov was the Russian general, Montgomery from Britain and Eisenhower from the U.S. Obviously, Germany was the enemy then. Right. And my German colleague really felt it. It was really a lonely, moving mm -hmm. time for him. So that was a real capstone experience, you know, that in the life journey, you pick up along the way. You don't I didn't know this when I was a lieutenant. I, I don't know if I could have done it when I was a lieutenant, but you you, you learn along the way. And uh, but, but to be willing to step into the darkness with faith or confidence, you know, whatever your your belief system is, how that supports you to be able to to go out alone in the dark uh, with people who may never want to be leaders, and not everybody wants to, right. and that's okay too. But they, we need them to be good teammates because we're going. Yes. And we need you to come with us. <laughs> right. Well, oh, I, I love that. And, you know, not everybody wants to be a four-star general. Some no. people just want to launch and recover, be a crew dog or a crew right. chief or, you know, whatever, bag drive, whatever. Uh, but I love that. Well, I'll tell you what, Michelle, you have certainly, certainly paid the price of leadership and continue to do so. Hi again, everyone. We had yet another technical difficulty. We lost power for several hours. So Michelle Johnson sends her farewell. As I said before, we so rudely were cut off from our power source. Um, please be sure and check out Michelle, Lieutenant General Retire Michelle Johnson, a trailblazer. I hope you enjoyed everything she shared with you about what it takes to paying the price of leadership. And remember, you will be the same person five years from now that you are today, except for two things the people you meet, and the books you read. So I hope you heard us talk about a lot of tremendous books. You met a tremendous person today. And I want to thank you for paying the price of leadership. If you like what you heard, please hit the subscribe button, leave us the honor of a five-star review, and share with your friends who are trying to live a, tri a triumphantly tremendous life as well. Thanks so much to all of you for paying the price of leadership. Have a tremendous rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Tremendous Leadership with Dr. Tracy Jones. Find out more about Dr. Jones at www.tremendousleadership.com. If you've been ignited by something you heard in this episode, let us know by leaving a review for Tremendous Leadership wherever you listen to podcasts or by sending us a message through www.tremendousleadership.com.